Hey everyone, the name is Eric Dorn. and today I want to talk about the self-development problem. I want to talk about this issue because I see a lot of people stuck in this kind of race to kind of dominate or make up for, compensate for things in themselves that they feel weak or bad about. And the thing is, we all have things that we feel weak and bad about. And there is this pressure from society to be a person without weakness. This pursuit for perfection often uh, creates this... Uh, chase this urge to find and eliminate anything inside of you that you don't feel good about then there's most likely going to be a quite a few things that you don't feel good about but often it's important to recognize that weaknesses often rest upon as the other side of the strength often there are things inside of us that when we try to compensate for them we kind of also eliminate the strengths that rest behind besides them there are things, you know, when it comes to questions of beauty and what's beautiful and so on and so forth that are essentially quite subjective in the sense that some people will find them beautiful and other people will find them ugly. In a sense that, yeah, there are things in us that uh, are more personal, things in you that are more deeply personal than others, things that matter to you and things that don't matter to you. And I see a lot of people caught up in this race to kind of make up for and to become good at things they actually don't value. This quest is uh, often related to the question of the inferior function in Carl Jung's uh, psychology. Inferior functions uh, represent the values and things inside of us that are a less important part of the psyche. They don't matter as much, they're not as important, that we don't value them. They can have things for me, for example, that has to do with materialism, it has to do with the possession of stuff. It's not something I value, it's not something I need. It's not something that is fundamentally important to me. But at the same time, I can find myself feeling bad for lack um, of material standard. Like, I can feel bad for not being as good at that question of yourself that is the pragmatic self. I, I, I struggle to be a pragmatic person. I'm an idealist. And uh, in, that, uh, in, in that experience, there is uh, something I'd like to call insecurity. Insecurity is at the root of the inferior function. I would say the inferior function represents an insecurity. And uh, often what we find when we work on our insecurities, <laughs> well, the issue is we spend more time working on compensating for our insecurities than actually responding to them. Often the message shouldn't be I need to change myself, it should be I should be happy with myself for who I am. And uh, if you look at the 9FJ's uh, inferior functions, and yeah, I say functions plural here, uh, for example, I talk about uh, extroverted sensing, which has to do with the, your ability to be present and attentive and in the moment and to uh, be on stage and to be in a crowd and around other people. I talk about the ability to bring out and share with other people, to put everything on the table, to uh, be open with other people. I'm talking about extroverted thinking, which is about your ability to be pragmatic and your ability to recognize the system around you and to adhere to its rules and to look around you and to look at what works. Uh, I talk about, uh, for example, uh, your ability to go in the moment, to show and to act on instinct, to act on reflex. Um, thinking about the, your ability to play tactically, you know, to conserve, to choose the right moment and to be able to be tactical. Those are all things that INFJ struggle with and uh, personally, like, uh, those questions can bring up like deep-rooted insecurities in myself. Uh, I can fault myself for not being able to play the game or for not being able to think about things in a pragmatic fashion. I can fault myself for not having enough money or material wealth. I can fault myself for uh, not uh, being able to be smart about things and to play the game strategically. I can fault myself about uh, showing bad judgment in the moment of showing bad instinct uh, when, when in the heat of the moment I always struggle to show a good judgment and to uh, show a clear head 
and I can struggle to be present and to be engaged around other people, you know, in a crowd or at a party. It's very difficult for me to keep my attention up, to keep my interest up, to keep my energy up. And it's very much an insecurity in those situations. And that's uh, how the inferior manifests. People often think that uh, for an INFJ or an INTJ, the inferior function manifests as a uh, overeating or being gluttonous, but often it's the contrary. It's uh, the inferior function bubbles up when you retreat to a crowded space and you can't really be around other people and you feel overwhelmed and you feel stressed out or you feel pressure to be on and you feel like you have to be more active for other people, you have to be more engaging, you have to be more fun, you have to be more... Yeah, it's like one core example that I think is so crucial. Like once uh, NJs stress themselves out too much, they rush themselves, you know, and being an intuitive and judging type requires you to be walk your own way in life, to be original, it engages you to look at the long term, it engages you to look at the future, but then you can start rushing yourself, SP comes up and it t uh, rushes you and it says, well, sure you have this long term plan, but what about now, what about now, what about now? And why aren't you getting there yet? Why aren't you there? Where, why aren't you there yet? You know, NJ is this ability to go and drive for a long time, even if you don't get anything from it. SP is that fear, that insecurity that says, why aren't you there? Now? Why haven't you arrived? What are you doing here? Why are you still here? <laughs> it's that pressure. And it's um, that pressure is more there to the detriment of an INFJ than to the success of an INFJ. It uh, keeps you from truly pursuing your long-term goal and it distracts you from it. So it's so important in that sense to tame it and to uh, respond to it and to recognize that yeah, the fear is there, the inferior function is there, it's there to guard me and it's there to protect me and to make sure I don't get hurt. But in the end, I have to go for what I want. No matter what, I have to go for what I want. Otherwise, I won't be happy, you know. Uh, play the game too much, uh, force yourself to be on for other people, you just find yourself depressed, exhausted, overwhelmed, and you'll find yourself far beyond your potential, far beyond your capacity. And that's the thing, like when you spend all the time working on your weak spots, what it's like, it's kind of like you're carrying around this big baggage, you're carrying around this big chain, this big chain ball that weighs a lot, that weighs a ton, and you're trying to pull it with you, you're trying to uh, reach what you want and you're trying to reach your success while holding on to stress of the past and, ex uh, and issues and insecurities and trying to take them with you. And what is the point of taking it with you? What do you need it for? You have to recognize what you value and you have to respect what you value. You have to, if you have boundaries, if you need boundaries to be happy and to thrive and to be engaging in relationships, you have to set boundaries, otherwise you won't be happy. <laughs> it's, uh, it's like uh, at times we're trying to tame ourselves. We're trying to tame ourselves and to change what we want and to force ourselves into situations we don't want to be in. We're trying to change ourselves and we kind of start second guessing ourselves. I, I know people that second guess what they want and they say, I wish I was a person that wanted to be materialist. I wish I was a person that cared about these things. I wish I was a more engaging and attentive and fun person that could be more on, more out there. And uh, at the same time, it's like, I wish that I wanted something. I, it's like a double want. It's like a double-ended want. Like, I want to want. <laughs> no, it's not that I want. Yeah, and uh, that is, of course, in a sense, the ultimate self-disrespect. Uh, to disrespect what you want and to tell yourself it's bad to want it and to feel bad for wanting it and to feel like you must want something else or that you should want something else. It's the ultimate disrespect and it's the ultimate slap in the face because it really hurts, you know. And whenever you say that, whenever you do that, it really hurts. It's really self-harm. Uh, it's self-harm because uh, every time you say it, you kind of deny yourself uh, who you are. You kind of deny yourself what you want to be happy. <laughs> it's, uh, if we make it so much more practical, it's like, uh, knowing that uh, you want to eat food, food, but telling yourself not to eat food. Uh, it's like uh, knowing you need to sleep, but telling yourself I don't, I shouldn't sleep. <laughs> it's uh, the ultimate self disrespect because it's the ultimate deprival of happiness, and uh, almost all of the negative emotions we bring up in ourselves—you know, anxiety, shame, 
uh, fear and uh, anger all stem from this ultimate self deprivation you know uh, if you look at the Enneagram the gut types the uh, anger types the eight nine and one they're depriving themselves from a happy and contented life uh, the head types the anxiety types they're depriving themselves from feeling satisfied with themselves and with what they can do and with who they are the heart types they're depriving themselves from feeling good about themselves and how they are and what kind of people they are and the three instincts, the sexual, social, and self-preserving instincts, they deprive themselves from what they want and what they need to be happy. And that's the ultimate, like, that's what drives all these uh, uh, terrible insecurities, like perfectionism, like uh, um, social anxiety, and all these uh, negative struggles that we have to all deal with on a daily basis. And that, of course, brings us back to the question of the inferior function. Should we seek to tame it? Well, there is nothing to lose from it, from going into your inferior function, but the happiness that you feel in the moment when you develop it, the happiness you lose every time you spend focusing on uh, material pursuits when you're an artist or every time you focus on uh, uh, like following the rules or the norms of society when you're a creative type or a rebel it's uh, just uh, how much of your happiness are you prepared to give up and how much of pressure and stress do you want to bring on yourself how much how do you want to feel about yourself as a person that important question is ultimately like uh, the biggest question I'd like to raise to a lot of the self-help book writers out there, you go to the shelves, go to all those book titles, all of them are about how you can become more efficient, better, uh, and so on and so on. But nobody asks, to why, what purpose? To what purpose do I want this? To what purpose do I want to become more efficient? To what purpose do I want to be more popular with other people? What is the purpose of it and will it make me happy? And ultimately, a lot of these people that write these books are deeply unhappy people. And that's the reason they're writing these self-help books and that's why they're dealing with these prospects. They're deeply unhappy people and they're trying to tell you how you can do what they did, even though they are deeply unhappy. Should we really be following their advice? Or should we be listening to ourselves and what we want instead?